Hello all and welcome to another episode of Your One Black Friend. I am your hostess, Jolie, or you can call me Joe. I wanted to talk about a comment that I received on an Instagram video I posted. It was a clip from the episode we did on quantum immortality from a materialist perspective, right? So we talked about the power of infinity, the documentary. I think that the documentary is called A Trip to Infinity. And we sort of expanded on that, right? If given enough time, everything repeats, then inevitably you will repeat. You will sort of die, disintegrate and reform again. And then given enough time, that sort of re formation, right? The degradation and reformation from a perspective outside of time begins to look like a pattern, right? With slight deviations. And then I built upon that thought to say that what if a super intelligence, what we would consider a super intelligence is in control or is behind this destruction and then reformulation that occurs. And that basically explains the nature of our reality tying it back, of course, to all of this being a simulation. Hard to see the forest through the trees, but if you take a step out of it and think in terms of what we consider billions or trillions of years in time to us, made to an entity outside of a simulation, outside of a construct, be just a blip. And that's, of course, also a quote directly from, so you're living in a simulation, available for purchase right now on Amazon. But I digress back to the discussion. So if everything repeats and even a materialist, we're not even talking about esoteric approaches that have talked about, right? Eastern philosophy that has talked about how we do reincarnate. The consciousness always has been, always will be. It's one consciousness inhabiting various forms. What that episode was about was just from purely materialist approach. Even if you focus on just physical form, even that repeats. So we've got both sides basically saying the same thing. I talked about Uspensky and his concept of the eternal return. We talked about Nietzsche basically saying the same thing, Gurdjieff, saying the same thing that everything loops. We have quantum physicists saying the same thing that everything repeats. We look around, everything is a cycle. You look at the seasons, everything is a cycle. Taking to its logical conclusion at the end of your life, there is a chance, there is a probability, a high probability that you repeat the same life again. Labyrinth of Time is a great read on this if you want more information on this by Anthony Peake. I always think about the song, closing time, every new beginning is some other beginnings end. That light at the end of the tunnel when you are dying or at a end of life experience, however you wanna look it, could also be the light that a baby sees when it comes back into this world. So we're talking specifically about reincarnating into the same life. Zbensky and Gurdjieff, they theorize. They're saying that a person loops that same life over and over again, but if you become conscious enough, if you try to consciously remember, then the next sort of cycle, you can start changing, making different choices to turn that cycle into a spiral and then exit out of here if you believe that exit is possible. I have written a book where I talk about my theories as to, for example, when we sleep, I do think that we exit the construct. I don't think that you have to wait till you die to exit the simulation. Then again, it depends on when you catch me. Some days I do feel like perhaps this is some sort of confine, some sort of prison that we've maybe lost control of, that it started off as a simulation to sort of have this experience that we who we truly are, are eternal beings who created a construct where things die, where things end, to have that experience of forgetfulness that we actually want to forget. And then something happened and we got lost in the cycle. Like I said, it depends on when you catch me, right? Today I'm thinking it's giving, it's a, it's a bit of a dark day. So today I'm thinking, okay, we're stuck in the cycle, but we do exit. We just don't remember when we come back in. You know, a lot of people have a problem with reincarnation because they say that the the catch, the catch 22 is how can I be held responsible for something that I have no remembrance of doing? And, and let me break that down, what that means, okay? So at your end of life review, which a lot of people have reported when they have a near-death experience, I call it a death experience because I think that people actually die 
and then come back. It's not a near death experience. They were actually, they actually died. If you're reviewing your life, it's not a near death experience. You are, you were dead. You review your life and then they ask you, do you want to come back? All right. Actually, it seems like a lot of people that have NDEs aren't given a choice to come back. Like they're basically told that you have to come back. The thing that's worth noting is that if I am sent back, whether it's back to the same life or to reincarnate into a new avatar, if I'm sent back with no memory of my past life, of the things that I did in the past, you wipe my memory, then how am I supposed to make any changes? How am I supposed to learn, right? So if you meet an entity at the end of your life and they say, they show you your life and they make you feel, as a lot of NDEs have reported, near death experiencers have reported that they make you feel how you made other people feel. First and foremost, you are unconscious. Most people are unconscious most of their lives. Most people are so focused on just day-to-day existence on their own, like their own mind, what's going on in their own life, just trying to get by. Most people are so like plagued by their internal monologue that's just punishing them, that's just saying things to them, causing suffering, that they can't even look beyond themselves. They're just trying to survive. Like I said, this is a dark day. And I'm saying it's a dark day because I have experienced it for the past week. I've been sort of plagued by that same internal monologue. The difference is that over time, taking sulforaphane with mustard seed, microdosing mushrooms, meditating, I have learned to sit and observe what the internal monologue does when I start sort of being shifted down this path of what society would call depression, right? When I start becoming depressed, when I enter into a depressive state, before you get lost into the noise of the internal monologue and what it does, for those of you privileged to to not have to experience depression, what it does is it takes your whole life and it finds like the 5% that is bad in your life, or maybe just not even bad, it's not necessarily bad, just 5% that's not how you want your life to be. And the internal monologue goes, that is now 100% of your life. It sort of, it, emphasizes, it magnifies the 5% that's wrong in your life. That's not where you want it to be. It's not even, like I said, doesn't even have to be wrong. And it says, this is your life. And what happens is you get kind of pulled into that and you start feeling sorry for yourself. And you do start to say, yes, that is true. This didn't go the way I wanted to go. This isn't where I want to be in my life right now. This isn't this, that, and the other. You hyper-focus on the 5%. Now for psh, over three decades, that was my mindset, right? I would get on these states where I would be really manic and be really good. And then the depression would set in and then I would just be lost in my head, right? Because before you even have the chance to face today, here's this voice, here are these images of all the things that aren't going the way you want them to be. Now, I don't know why there's a correlation between sulforaphane and an internal monologue. I really don't yet. I can offer speculations, but not on this episode right now. But over time with adaptogens with sulforaphane with meditation all of that i've started to learn how this voice operates and what i've done is when it starts i tell myself we don't really need to be thinking that like of all the things you could think about this isn't it two i actually sometimes use the darker aspects of my perception on reality that this might be some sort of prison that we as immortal creatures have gotten ourselves trapped in. And by immortal creatures, I mean a consciousness, conscious entities existing in physical form or serving time in the third dimension, however you want to perceive it. Um, Very serious as to the nature of our reality. I definitely don't claim to have the answer or the truth, at least from within the construct. We know all outside of the construct, but the function of the construct is to limit but I digress. I will use this concept of, okay, this might be um, a prison. And I would sit with myself and say, listen, Joe, if you are in some sort of prison, if you are trapped in some sort of existence, to only have 5%, if those are the things that are wrong in your life, that aren't going the way you want them to go compared to what other people have to experience. And I'm just being realistic. Like I know it's not PC to basically compare yourself to other people, but the Stoics wrote about this. They say, stop comparing yourself to the 1% that's ahead of you and look back. It's very easy to get sucked into the woe is me. I don't have this. And what I've training my mind to do is once I catch myself listening to the internal monologue, I shift over here and I go, listen, there are people in way worse situations than me. Just the mere fact that I live in America I've got running water, I have electricity, I have lights. I can, I can sit in the safety of my own home. I am doing better 
than a lot of people on this planet right now. And that just the continuous shift of, I will not allow myself to feel sorry for myself because the fact of the matter is like, I'm healthy. I can breathe. I can walk. I can talk. I have people who care about me. I am able to express myself. I may not be where I want to be, but I am sure as hell grateful for where I am now. Being able to disconnect from the woe is me and shift back to the, this is where I am. Not, I'm not where I want to be is how I silence and disconnect from the internal monologue. So I don't know how I got off on a tangent, but I'm sure I'll find a way to connect it back to what the purpose of this discussion is. Ultimately, if this is some sort of construct where we are consciousness sort of trapped in 3D, it is worth noting that there are ways in which we can work with the construct long-term, should we forget. What do I mean by that? So I posted the video on my Instagram channel and was a clip. It said something to the effect of that perhaps the forgetfulness, the reason why we forget is to stop us from going mad if we have to sort of remember the same life. And if we're reliving the same life over and over again, the forgetting is a function. The question that was left in the comment, shout out, shout out to Tarnish Gunnigar. She said, I picked up the graphic novel version of the demon sermon of the martial arts. And in the first story, a character is agonizing over reincarnating as a lower form of life. My greatest fear is facing a new life without all my possessions, skills to use them and the knowledge that I've gained. Facing a new life, facing a new incarnation without all the knowledge that you've garnered from this present incarnation. I definitely share um, Tarnish Gunger's fears, concerns. Imagine you you kind of wake up in a new in, in a new iteration of this present avatar. We're not even going to talk about a new incarnation. Let's just say you wake up in the new iteration of this present avatar. So I'm Jolie again, looping. I'm going to have to loop the same thing over again. But all of a sudden I'm like, wait, this feels familiar. Like certain experiences, I go to certain places and like I look at certain people and I'm just like, why does I feel like I met you before? You have a conversation with a person, you know, why do I feel like I've had this come? But you've had that all your life. This very conversation, this very podcast feels like I've said this before, and maybe I have, which means that on some level, even though I have forgotten that I have, it's not just memory that you need to remember. What do I mean by that? I saw a video on Instagram. This podcast is gonna be all over the place, but I'm hoping <laughs> that you guys can follow me because I am just fleshing things out as I'm going along. So bear with me. I saw a video on Instagram. There was a lady who used to be a ballerina dancer. She had lost her memory to dementia but they played the music anyway that she used to dance to. And all of a sudden she came alive and her body still moved. Her body still danced. That told me that there's more to memory than the brain. That told me that consciousness awareness is more powerful. That told me that even though the brain still limits consciousness while it is confined to form, there's something else that remembers. And it's not in the way that maybe the brain will remember. It's, it can express itself in different ways. I'll say this again, memory, remembrance, remembering can express itself in different ways. It's that sort of recognition of, I have been here before. I have heard, you know, had this conversation before. I recognize your face. Don't discount that. Don't disregard that. Maybe it doesn't fall into what we are told is possible, but you're gonna have to learn to just trust yourself that it is in fact possible, that you can remember things. Like when you go to paint for the first time and all of a sudden it still feels like you've done this before. Things that you naturally gravitate towards and the first time you do it, it's like, no, I've always done this. That is a hint, that is a memory. It may not be coming from the brain, but there are other ways that consciousness can remember. There's things when you go and you meet a person and you feel them. That is a way that consciousness is signaling back to itself, a memory. Now, what I said to Tarnished Gunner is, um, it's why I, I put out all of these episodes of the podcast. It's also why I'm gonna start putting out more books. Whether or not people, a ton of people read it, it doesn't matter. What's most important to me is to be able to take something from here and make it physical, make it tangible. The reason why I say this is because I don't know if I'm gonna reincarnate, I don't remember. I don't remember in the way that I could say, oh yes, pure recall, I have deja vu. I have those feelings that I've talked to you, you know, I just mentioned about, but the way that, you know, I remember, like I remember 
you know, my trip to London or whatever. It's not, it doesn't express in that way. I don't know if this is the first time. I just feel it. And I wish we lived in a reality where feeling things was just as important, held just as much importance as knowing things. But I trust my heart here. But I will say this, that books that have been written literally thousands of years ago have helped me remember my path, have helped me remember who I am, have helped me remember the nature of our reality. All the books that I continuously reference, like the Bhagavad Gita, the, I, I know I said that, <laughs> the Upanishads, I know I said that badly, the Upanishads, right? The Kabbalion, Letters from a Stoic. Letters from a Stoic was written 2000 years ago by Seneca the Younger. I always reference this book. I, I've never fallen in love with the mind the way I fell in love with the mind of Seneca the Younger. And he wrote this book 2000 years ago, but he 2000 years ago helped me remember who I am now. That is the importance of taking ideas and putting them in writing. I don't know, you don't know, we don't know if I am the reincarnated consciousness of the avatar or a consciousness that existed as Seneca the Younger. I'm not making such a claim by the way, mostly because I don't want people all up in my shit. I don't know though. <laughs> you don't know. We don't know who we are, right? We made the argument using, for example, the one electron hypothesis that all electrons are just one electron like existing simultaneously across space time, right? And then I've not seen this movie yet, but everything everywhere all at once kind of makes the same sort of idea. It's all We are all one consciousness simultaneously existing in different forms. Obviously, I also know that, that that movie did not generate that idea. That is an ancient Eastern idea that we're all Brahman experiencing itself in different form. Okay, so there's that. Bear that in mind. So then that means that, that any experience that I'm having, that I have right now, I must find a way to make tangible, to leave behind within the construct, in the construct, so that should I come back as a different avatar, all of the lessons from my life experiences in this avatar are there to meet me in the game. And not just me, but millions, if not billions of others, let's say millions because not everybody is awake. So millions, okay, hundreds of thousands <laughs> who are sentient within the construct. You cannot know that you will remember. You can certainly try. There are books out there. Uspensky and Gurdjieff, I will, you know, I, I'm referencing again. There are books out there that teach you or that say that they want to teach you how to remember, but you don't really know, know being the operative word. But what I do know for sure is that books have this way of still being here, unless of course all copies of them are burned, right? Shout out to the Library of Alexandria, <laughs> right, for the most part, right? If you can just take what you know and write it, even if you write it in papyrus and live it in a cave, leave it in a cave, I believe, I want to believe that somehow your own works, your own writings will find its way back to you, even if you are now existing in a different form, in a different physical form because of quantum entanglement. Go buy the book guys. So you're living in a simulation available now because of quantum entanglement. If you are the same consciousness, right? Existing in all these different forms, boop, 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 boop. It's the same consciousness inhabiting all forms across space time. And if all of time is happening right now, it's that same consciousness having all of these experiences, then you will be or are, you will be or are, you will be or you are entangled on a quantum level with all of the physical forms, all of the avatars that your consciousness is presently existing in. So you will find the books that you need, that you have written when you existed in other forms. I'll say that again, because of quantum entanglement. Yes, I understand that I'm taking sort of artistic license with this, but I've also just finished reading a lot about like Albert Einstein and he really venerated the creative thought. Like his reasoning was you create the ideas first and then you essentially make reality bend to your ideas, not the other way around. So um, I can do as I will, and I will do exactly that, right? I, I genuinely believe that, wh why wouldn't it be? Like, why wouldn't this be the case? Tell me if I'm wrong, why, why wouldn't 
if you are entangled on a quantum level with all versions of yourself because it's the same consciousness okay materialist you guys had that episode so we're now we're we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're we're shifting perspective but if it's the same consciousness that is inhabiting all of these forms then what you need will find its way to you and what you wrote with you in mind will find its way back to you and when you read these books they will feel like remembering i'll say that again when you read these books that you wrote, that your consciousness wrote when it existed as other avatars, it won't feel like knowledge. It will feel like remembering. And I think that that is how we go about remembering. That is how we sort of like hack the game. And maybe it's not even hacking. That is, in my opinion, something that is a feature of the game, which might be also why both, both get burned and banned and things of that nature. Bear that in mind. I think I've said a lot. I really want you guys to sit with that. I didn't want to make this episode long because I really want you to think about it. It is worth and it bears repeating the importance of whatever it is that you know, whatever it is that you have learned, whatever knowledge you've acquired, make it physical. Maybe bury it in a box somewhere or put it in a bottle and throw it in the ocean or publish it. If you don't want to sell it, you don't have to but have copies and put them somewhere. I firmly believe that on some level, your consciousness retains the memory. It may not, or it may be restricted by the brain and the avatar in which you inhabit, but I do firmly believe that the consciousness retains the memory of where you put this information in. And if you are able to look at yourself, not as just this avatar experiencing life in this form, right? But as consciousness experiencing life in a myriad of forms, if you can look beyond your own present incarnation and think of yourself truly as an immortal creature, as a timeless creature existing simultaneously right now in space time, then what you need will find you. What is tuned to your mind will find its way to you. It's like the algorithm, right? The more you sort of click on, like let's say Instagram, the more you click on certain things, the more it shows itself to you. But those things aren't happening by synchronicity. It's just that it is, it's aligned to your thoughts. But you were the one who first put in the sort of conscious action to click on certain things, right? So your mind is attracted to certain things. And so then you click on those things. And then those things, more of those things are shown to you. And I think that the same thing occurs in our reality. What we consider synchronicity is just more of a confirmation that your mind and reality are sort of in tuned and they work together. Now take that beyond your present incarnation and stretch that through time. Maybe that's how you remember. That has been sort of my experience. You guys have seen this happen even with the podcast. I will directly, and this was like 2020 was like really, really intense, but I will like talk about something on the podcast and then months later, I will come across a book where I'm, I was almost like directly quoting the book before I'd ever even read the book. So I know that that is possible. And that's just within my present incarnation as this present avatar. And I'm saying, take that, expand it beyond your present existence across all lifetimes, across all avatars. And I think that that's how we remember, or at least one of the ways that we can begin to remember. All right, guys. God bless. Thanks for listening.